Now, I'd like to throw it to my past self, because I recorded this interview a few weeks ago, Johnny, to interview University of Pennsylvania athlete Anthony Lottie in the first episode of our athletic interview series. I'd now like to welcome my old high school teammate and friend Anthony Lottie into this interview, uh, our season premiere of this series. I am so excited to get into this. Anthony, how are you doing? You know, I'm doing great, man. It's uh, It's been a while, so uh, anytime I can link up with the uh, a guy I shared the glory days with back in high school, you know, it's always a good time, man. So uh, I'm excited for this. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. This is a fun one for me. Anthony and I played Pop Warner football and high school football together. Lottie, you started your football career at the age of seven, is what you told our high school newspaper back in the day. And you had 11 different Division I offers coming out of high school. One of the things I want to get out of this series is talking about different experiences we all go through through different sports and how we could share that to the up and coming athletes, especially going into this wild, coming out of this wild time we've been in the past year, year and a half. What was your recruitment process like? Can you walk us through that at all? Yeah, so uh, my recruitment process was definitely kind of a whirlwind because, you know, when I, when I was coming up through Pop Warner, uh, you know, I had high school coaches attending my games and, you know, trying to get me to go to their, you know, respective high schools, you know, in terms of, you know, coming out of Pop Warner, you know, I had a, a pretty good Pop Warner career. You know, we had a very successful team, you know, as you, as you remember. And uh, it was very frustrating in the beginning because, you know, I was able to start varsity as a freshman and I was the first one to do that in Friel Township history. So I felt like I had a pretty good upper hand with trying to get recruited. And uh, I noticed a lot of guys who were, getting offers and they were getting these big time offers and they were being ranked on like two, four, seven sports and rivals.com. And it was extremely frustrating for me because I didn't know, you know, how I could get to that level. You know, I knew I had the ability to do that. I knew I had the work ethic, but you know, I wasn't getting the recognition. I quite frankly felt that I deserved. And uh, you know, there was a point where, you know, I was not contemplating giving up on playing college football, but I was at a crossroads because like, when am I going to get an offer? You know, I see these guys getting offers and I'm not getting them and I feel like I deserve them. So what do I have to do? And eventually, sorry about that, but I was able to, uh, you know, get invited to the Nike Spark Combine, which is, it's uh, a regional combine put on by Nike for, you know, the top 500 players in the region. So I was invited to uh, the Mid-Atlantic one where it was guys from, you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Delaware, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, et cetera. And, uh, I eventually go there and my combine numbers were, you know, very good with, you know, who I was going against. I was able to run, you know, four, four, eight, 40, uh, 43 inch vertical. I had 11, one broad jump and I ran a four, one, two short shuttle. And that was uh, number one overall in my position in the country. So I was number one amongst DBs and I was top 10 in the country for my score. And that's when I kind of noticed that I was kind of getting the recognition and I was kind of getting the respect that I felt like I, I quite earned, honestly. And, uh, that's when I started having more coaches from, you know, big 10 schools, ACC schools start to visit me at school. And then eventually, you know, I went to Temple and I was able to have a very good camp there, you know, and I eventually got my first offer from Temple. And after that, uh, the floodgates kind of opened from there. So I got Temple and then right after the next day I got Colgate and then I got Delaware. And then uh, next thing you know, the Ivy League started, you know, knocking on the door because, you know, my grades, my SAT scores, they all kind of matched up with Ivy League standards. And uh, at that point, I kind of knew, uh, you know, the chances of making it to the NFL are extremely slim. You know, you have a less than 1% chance of making it and especially making a career out of it where, you know, you can make your money and, you know, not have to get a second career. That's extremely rare. So I knew I had this golden opportunity to get into a school like Penn that I would normally never have. And, you know, I had offers from Penn, Yale, Cornell, uh, I want to say uh, Dartmouth as well. And uh, eventually, you know, I, I settled on going to Penn and, you know, looking back on it, you know, four years later, uh, actually recently graduating, thank God I made that decision because it opened up so many doors for me that, you know, normally I would never have if it weren't for football. And something that my dad always, you know, kind of emphasized to me was that use football, don't let football use you. And that's what I did. And uh, I was able to go to Penn. I was able to graduate with a degree from Penn and, you know, the rest is history from there. Yeah, I Definitely think remembering back your dad being one of our pop Warner coaches is always funny to look back on yeah. and kind of laugh about, uh, that's great advice for up and coming athletes, uh, using football to help you get to places you 
may or may not have gotten to without the sport. I kind of get, I, I, I agree with the whole feeling of how the football recruitment process can just be a whirlwind. How many camps did you end up going to? Do you remember at all? Yeah, I went to, I went to quite a few. I mean, I went to, I mean, first and foremost was the Nike Spar Combine. Uh, I went to Temple as well because they invited me and they said I was one of their quote unquote premier prospects that they were very heavily considering giving a scholarship offer to. Uh, I went to Rutgers as well. Um, I think those are the only three I went to my junior year going into my senior year, because when you go to those, you know, bigger FBS schools, you know, the FCS schools, D2, D3, they all follow. So when you go to Temple or you go to Rutgers, Delaware is going to be there. Mom is going to be there. Penn is going to be there. Harvard's going to be there. So I was able to kind of showcase my skills in front of, you know, dozens and dozens of different schools. And, you know, I didn't have to specifically go to a specific school that I wanted because I was very strategic with how I went about my camps. Because, I mean, as, as you know, and as anybody else who knows who's trying to get recruited in football, these camps take a lot out of you physically. I mean, you have to go there at 8 a.m. You got to run your 40. You got to do your vertical jump. You got to do your broad jump. You got to do all the combine tests. Then you have to go do one-on-ones. Then you got to go do drills. And it's very, you know, exhausting. So I had to be very strategic with how I went because I didn't want to go to you know, camps back to back days and run a four, four one day and then run a four, seven the next day, just because my legs were sore. So I ended up going to Nike and then I went to Temple and then I went to Rutgers. And then from there, I was able to accumulate the 11 offers that I had. How are you, I mean, choosing UPenn over a division one's FBS school like Temple, that's not a lot of choices. A lot of high school kids would probably do thinking, Oh, I can go to this division one FBS school over this FCS school. What got you to think the long term? With we'll get into how your career ended up going at UPenn. How are you? Right. What type of advice? I mean, because we're gonna get probably someone in the comment section saying, "How did you cho- turn down an FBS school offer?" Who helped guide you to make that lifelong decision over that four year decision? Don't get me wrong, man. It, it was very tough because, you know, I took a lot of, you know, visits to FBS schools. And, uh, you know, when you see these facilities and they, you know, these, these boosters are pumping in millions and millions of dollars to these facilities. And, you know, you see these, these big sexy stadiums and you see these locker rooms and you see these, you know, these weight rooms. And, you know, when you're a young 16 year old and, you know, you have this very dogmatic approach to football thinking, oh, I have to go play at the biggest school possible. That's the only way I'll be successful. And that's not the case. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really my dad who kind of, you know, swayed me into the way of thinking, you know, of going to the Ivy League. He said to me, and excuse my language here, he said, and you'd be a real fucking idiot if you, did, if you didn't go to Penn, because it's just an opportunity that I would never normally have. I mean, in order to get into, you know, any Ivy League school, whether it's Penn, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Cornell, Columbia, you name it, you, your academic standards have to be top notch. And, you know, thank God I had football because, it, you know, it gave me that extra boost to get into a school like that. And, you know, something that a quote that always stood out to me, you know, being a Notre Dame fan from, you know, the legendary Lou Holtz was, you know, college is a 40 year decision, not a four year decision. And, you know, that weighed heavily in my mind is that I had these opportunities to go to these prestigious universities and I would be, you know, very naive to pass those up because it's very rare you have that opportunity. And, you know, being able to go to Penn and, and meeting the people that I have and the connections you're able to leverage at schools like this, I mean, thank God I made that decision when I was 16 years old because I don't know where I'd be if it weren't for Penn. So you get to Penn. What's it like going from high school training camp into a Division I training camp, summer workouts? What's that like? And how did you – what was the adjustment period like? I would say that was definitely one of the harder times of my life was being able to transition from, you know, being the star in high school and, you know, being, you know, kind of the big fish in the little sea, you know, when you're in Pop Warner and you're a star and you go to high school and you're all stayed and, you know, you think you're going to have that same success just translate to the next level. And that's not the case at all, because when you get to that level, when you get to Division One football, every single guy there was you growing up. They were all the stars in high school. They were all the stars in Pop Warner football. And now you're kind of on this even playing field. So for me, you know, I kind of thought going into Penn, like, oh, I had these FBS offers, so I'm definitely going to be able to play as a freshman when I get to Penn. And I was hit with a rude awakening. You know, I I saw, you know, some top-notch athletes at Penn, you know, guys who were, you know, they looked the part, they played the part. I mean, they were all studs. And, you know, you see that right away. And 
you know, the adjustment period for me was, you know, when you get to Penn and, you know, you're the fourth string safety as a freshman and you're not playing and you're standing on the sidelines and it fucking sucks, you know, you kind of have to make a decision. Am I going to lie over, cry about it and quit? Or am I going to, you know, apply myself and work harder? And that's exactly what I did. You know, I, I, the day the season ended, you know, I asked to have a meeting with our D coordinator and I said, look, I'm not here to complain. I'm not here to, you know, bitch and cry about me not playing. I just want to know how can I be better? How can I improve? You know, what, what do I have to do to play? And I will do it. Just give me what you need me to work on. And he was very forthcoming. He said, listen, you know, you're, you're very talented. You know, you're probably the most athletic guy on this team. You need to work on this. You need to work on this. You need to work on this. And I applied those things. And then eventually come time for spring ball, uh, my freshman year, I went from being the fourth string safety to being the starting safety. So I was able to jump the juniors and seniors ahead of me. And then eventually got me to that starting role, you know, going into my sophomore year. Yeah. And so I think that's great advice and a great message to send of there's going to be a tough road going forward, whether you go to the D one level, the D three level NAIA. And that's why one of the main reasons, uh, I wanted to do this series was to cover all four levels of sports. It's why we're going to have different athletes of different sports throughout this series. So unfortunately you, from my research, you end up injuring your shoulder uh, during spring practice and you end up missing the season. What was that like having to deal with something like that after putting in all that work, earning the starting role, like you mentioned, and now all of a sudden you're back to almost square one again. Yeah. So that was definitely a challenge for me because growing up, I, I never really got injured. I mean, you remember, I mean, I didn't really miss any games. So an injury to me, obviously playing football, you know, if a, a sport as dangerous as that, you know, you, you're, you're going to be faced with injuries at some point or another. That's why they said the NFL, you know, NFL stands for not for long because, you know, everyone's getting hurt. So that's something I never really had to deal with. And I would definitely say, you know, going back in the summer of 2018, you know, training with Ryan Clark at RC Performance Training, I was training with him every single day. You know, I was dieting hard. I was really trying to focus and hone in on my craft and really trying to be technically sound as defensive back and, you know, improve my ball skills, improve my footwork, improve my hips, improve my, you know, mobility and my quick twitch muscles. And I really felt like I did that. But I had this nagging shoulder injury that went back to, you know, my, my spring ball freshman year. You know, I tore my labrum. And that's not really, I mean, for everybody who plays football, that's not really an uncommon injury to get is when you tear your labrum. It's very common. But for me, you know, being defensive back, when I was constantly, you know, having to play press man and constantly having to put my shoulders out and hold on to guys and engage in blocks, you know, my shoulder would just tear more and more and more. And it got to a point where if I played press coverage on a 165 pound receiver, my shoulder was going to pop out. I mean, this shoulder popped out of its socket. I mean, God, like over 50 times. I mean, I, the pain that you feel when your shoulder pops out of its socket and it's just hanging there and then you have to pull your bar back and put it back in. It was brutal. So I cared about football so much. I still do. I loved football so much to the point where I was going to play through anything. Like I had this opportunity to start at a division one school as a sophomore. I worked my ass off and I got to that point where I said, okay, I'm putting all this aside. I'm going to put mind over matter and I'm just going to keep playing. And it got to a point where, you know, I ended up making a tackle on our starting running back in a, uh, a game scrimmage in uh, fall camp my sophomore year. And then from there, my labrum completely tore through. I tore my rotator cuff completely through. I had a grade three separation of my AC joint. And how your shoulder's like a ball and socket, you know, joint like this. The ball, like my humerus bone, actually punched through the socket. It was just sitting in it. And when that happened, it clipped a nerve in my neck and I got nerve damage. So all of these things just happened, you know, in one hit. And, you know, I was laying on the ground, like screaming in pain and the trainers had to take me on the sideline and they actually had to, since I couldn't lift my arm, they had to cut with a scissor and a knife through my Jersey and cut my shoulder pads off and just take my pads off. So at that point I knew, okay, whatever I have is pretty serious. And this looks like it's going to be a long-term thing. And then eventually, you know, I get my surgery and they say it's an eight, not eight to nine month recovery for what I had. And uh, I eventually started going through the rehab process. And that was really tough mentally. I mean, anybody who's been injured, they can tell you that the hardest part about being injured is not the physical, it's the physical issue, it's mental. Because when you're not physically healthy, you're not mentally healthy either. 
So I was really struggling, you know, having to watch football from the sideline and being a, a huge bulky sling and having to do all these rehab exercises and see kind of all my hard work just kind of diminish. And that really sucked. It took a toll on me mentally. And that's when, you know, I started to start, you know, taking care of my mental health and, you know, seeking counseling and all those things. And, you know, eventually it got to a point where I come back to spring ball my sophomore year and I'm wearing, you know, one of those red jerseys that say, you know, you can't touch this guy. He's not doing any contact. So when I went back, I started running. And as I was running, I noticed my whole left arm would just go numb and then I couldn't feel the tips of my fingers. So at first I was thinking, all right, maybe this is just working out the kinks from the shoulder surgery. I'm just going to get the movement back. And then I noticed, you know, from practice one, two, three, four, five, and then by practice six, I stopped because I noticed this is just getting worse. And then, you know, I meet up with our doctor and he says, yeah, you have thoracic outlet syndrome. Like I, I can't clear you to play. And that was a really hard thing for me to deal with because, you know, in my mind, I had this whole vision of myself winning an Ivy league championship and balling out at Penn and maybe having a shot of going to the NFL and getting drafted. I had all these things set out for myself and it was just gone like that. And that was a, a really hard thing for me to deal with. You know, I fell into, you know, a, a dark place in life. I was very, you know, sad. I was angry, but eventually, you know, life goes on. You had to keep moving on. And eventually, you know, I was able to stick around the football team in a coaching role, but you know, that's kind of how the chips fell at Penn. Yeah, making that decision at 20 years old to hang it up and having to deal with that while at an Ivy League school dealing with an Ivy League dealing with an Ivy League education had to be one of the toughest things. But now we get into one of my favorite parts of your story. So I want to make sure I say everything right. Uh, every year, Penn enrolls you guys into uh, be a match, which is a the world's largest bone marrow registry. They've been doing this for 12 years. And I, you mentioned in an Asbury Park article that there's this 1% chance that you end up being a match. And as you're preparing for finals, your sophomore year, I'm sophomore or junior yeah. year, uh, you sophomore get a phone year, call yeah. that you, mm -hmm. that 1% was a match for you. And you don't even hesitate to... Yeah say yes you you do it immediately what was that like now that you didn't have football go now that you were in a coaching role at Penn you're through finals you're now dealing with this crazy like this awesome this crazy event of being a bone marrow uh being a donor can you talk us through like what that was like and how how it was for you yeah, I mean, that was really just a, a crazy day because I, I still remember back, I was I was in the library, I was in this like this little cubicle by myself, I was typing like a philosophy paper for finals. And then eventually, you know, we did the be the match, but when I enrolled, you know, we did it back in, I want to say January of 2018. So I get the call in April of 2019. So almost like 14 or 15 months later, I completely forgot I was even in the registry. It never crossed my mind because you know, you give a little cotton swab, you put it in a little baggie and it's kind of just like it's off its way and it's gone forever, you know, because again, more than 99% of the people are not getting that call. So statistically speaking, I just thought, okay, I'm done. This is probably never going to happen for me. And it, it happened when I was, you know, really in that, that dark pitfall, you know, of my life when I didn't have football, because I was still dealing with that. And it was only like a month after, you know, I made the decision that I wasn't going to play anymore. And I get the call. And I saw it was like a, a Minnesota number because that's where the beat the match, you know, headquarters is. So I was like, Minnesota. I was like, is this a telemarketer? I was like, who, who is calling me from Minnesota? And then I answer and somebody from beat the match saying, hi, Anthony, do you, do you have a minute? And I said, yeah, what's going on? And they said, well, we just want to inform you that you are in fact a match for a 37 year old mother with leukemia. You know, we just want to know, are you willing to undergo further blood testing to ensure that you are in fact a match? And at that point, you know, it wasn't even a, a decision for me. I thought, yes, I'll absolutely do this because you know, it kind of felt like divine intervention because, you know, while I was going through this, you know, horrible time in my life, you know, I had this other thing just kind of pop out of nowhere. And it kind of gave me that reassurance because I was kind of going through like an identity crisis at that time because every time somebody saw me, you know, it was always like, oh, how's football going? Like, oh, well, how's football going? When, when can we come see you play? But at this point, when this happens, it kind of showed me like, okay, I'm much more than a football player. Like my purpose in life is far bigger than just playing on a football field. It's bigger than just the ball. 
And I got that call and immediately just my optimism, my outlook on life just went through the roof. And I was just so happy to be a part of something like this. And it was such an easy decision to make because, I mean, God forbid, knock on wood, if I were in that position, if somebody I loved were in that position, if that were my mother or somebody else that I loved, <clears throat> you know, I would want somebody to do that for me. And I want somebody to do that for my family. So the fact that I was able to, you know, kind of go through that and kind of undergo that procedure to, you know, save the life of somebody else, it's something that I'll, I'll just truly never forget. So then things get even crazier and you get invited to Super Bowl 54 by Roger Goodell. Yeah. 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 Can you walk us through that day? Like how it just all went down? Yeah. So, so what happened was apparently, so from what I was told was that Roger Goodell read the article from the Asbury Park Press because it's kind of like from the area. So I guess he was still subscribed to the newspaper online and he heard about it. And then he reached out to my coach, Ray Priori, and said, hey, like, I want to invite this kid to the Super Bowl and I want to interview him. Is there any way you can make this happen? And my coach thought, yeah, absolutely. So my coach didn't tell me about this. He did not tell me at all that this was happening. All he told me was that, hey, like, be the match wants to do an interview on you. They just want to talk about your experience. He really downplayed the entire thing. So good for him for like not giving it away at all. So he's like, hey, we just want to, they just want to interview you, you know, kind of just talk about your experience and like what we do here at Penn, you know, just show up in a Penn football polo at 11 in the coach's office and, you know, they'll do the interview there. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And this is kind of like what we're doing right now. Like I talked about it so much prior while it was happening to the point I thought I was like, okay, this is just another interview I'm going to do. And then I sit down and it's on like a Skype call and I'm looking in like the background and Goodell's not sitting there yet, but I see like an NFL emblem in the back and that kind of caught my eye, but I didn't really think anything of it. Cause it said, it was like, it said like NFL headquarters back there. And I didn't really put two and two together. I was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Like, is this guy like a big football fan? I don't know. And then next thing you know, my coach is like, okay, interview's about to start. Here he comes, sits down. It's Roger Goodell. And immediately my mind was blown because I was like, why are you talking to me? I was like, what did I do? I was like, how, how, how are you talking to me? And he's like, Hey man, I'm Roger Goodell. How are you? I was like, Oh, I know who you are. I was like, of course I know who you are. And we were just going back and forth for a little bit. The video only really shows like two minutes of the conversation we had, but we talked for like 20 minutes. I mean, he was an awesome guy. I mean, he was a very nice guy to talk to. He was asking about Penn and, you know, he's a Columbia alum. So we're just talking some Ivy league football. And then eventually, you know, he points at the bone marrow donation and said, Hey, what you did was really awesome. And uh, eventually he presented me a football and said, Hey man, listen, you're a leader in this community and we need more guys like you. And, you know, I want to invite you and your buddy to the Super Bowl." And, you know, that was unbelievable because never in a million years did I think I'd get free tickets to the Super Bowl. And we go, uh, it was in Miami. It was uh, Kansas city versus San Francisco. And uh, we're sitting kind of like the nosebleeds, but I, I, I didn't care at all. I was, I was just excited to be there. And then eventually you know, one of his, you know, personnel people or one of his, you know, employees comes up to my seat and they're like, oh, uh, Mr. Lottie, do you have a minute? And I was like, yeah, what's up? What's going on? And they're like, uh, Mr. Goodell would like you to come to a suite right now if you want to go. Like, do you want to go? And I was like, uh, hell yeah, I want to go. That sounds awesome. So we take the elevator down to like the, uh, <clears throat> like the, the suite area of like that level of like uh, Hard Rock Stadium. And uh, I walk out of the elevator. Like as I'm walking out of the elevator, Julian Edelman is walking in the elevator and I didn't know what to do. Like I panicked. So I just gave him like a, like a head nod. I was like, Oh, I was like, oh what's up Julian. And he just gave me like one of these. And like, while he did this, he had like his three Super Bowl rings here. And I was like, Oh my God. I was like, I shouldn't, I do not. I was like, I do not belong in this vicinity at all. And then, uh, so we're waiting outside for a little bit. We're in like the, the concourse area where they're having like buffet and my brother pointed out to me that Lady Gaga was like five feet away from me. And I was like, okay, this is a lot for me. I'm going to have like a, a panic attack. Like this is, I don't belong around these people. So eventually we go in to the commissioner suite. And when I go in there, I see Goodell. I see Jeff Bezos. I see Lizzo. I see Keegan-Michael Key. I see Miles Teller. I see Rob Manfred. Uh, I see Chris Berman. I see Tony Dungy. And I'm like, what the fuck? I was like, what did I walk into? I was like, holy Jesus. And I'm just standing there so awkwardly. Like I'm sweating because I don't know what to do. And then this, the woman who like walked us in, she said, uh, 
like, oh, wait, what are you doing? She was like, go around and talk to people. Like, just go around and mingle. I was like, I can't just go up and talk to these people. I was like, do you, do you know who these people are? I was like, I can't go up and talk to them. And they're like, she was like, okay, who do you want to meet? I'll introduce you. And I was like, can I talk to Bezos? I was like, that sounds kind of cool. And she was like, that's actually the one person I can't let you talk to. And I was like, listen, that's fair. I, I don't want him to like mail me coronavirus or anything. So I'm just going to stay out of that. And next thing you know, I was like, oh, can I talk to Chris Berman? And I talked to Chris Berman. He shakes my hand. He's like, hey, man, like I heard about what you did. It's awesome for you to be here. And I was beaming with happiness. So I talked to Berman. I talked to Rob Manfred. I talked to Goodell. I talked to, you know, Miles Teller, Keegan-Michael Key. Lizzo was a little hammered, so I didn't really get the chance to talk to her. But I mean, again, that's an experience that like I truly will never forget. And I'm like so eternally grateful for that I was able to experience that, especially with my brother and, you know, one of my friends from school who also did a... Uh, a bone marrow transplant. So like being able to experience that with those guys, you know, where we were, I mean, it really just was unbelievable. Like it's something I'll really never forget. So after all that, you mentioned this earlier in the interview, you end up becoming a student manager slash kind of a coach. What, what was the yeah. difference between coaching and being a player? I would say being a player, uh, it's way more, you know, obviously there's like a physical element to it. You know, you can better your, you know, your body and you can better, you know, your footwork and better, you know, your, your technique and you can watch more film. Whereas, you know, my role with the team, it was kind of more, you know, being that I was in the system for a few years and I understood the playbook and I understood what the coaches wanted to see and, you know, what they wanted to see from the safeties. My role was kind of just, you know, educating those young guys, you know, getting those young guys up to speed and, you know, like talking to the freshmen, being like, hey, when you see this, make sure, you know, you're filling the B gap on this, not the C gap. Make sure you get down there fast. You're like, oh, if you're playing that cover three, make sure you disguise it by staying on the hash and then get back and, you know, kind of stare at the quarterback's eyes. So kind of just passing on the knowledge that I have of just the things I've seen playing college football to these guys who were in my position two years prior. You know, they're all scared little puppies and they're the little fish in the big sea. So I kind of wanted to be that confidant for them being like, listen, anything you need to talk about come talk to me. Like, I'm always here for you guys. Any questions you have, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I've asked every stupid question in the book and DB meetings. So anything you want to ask, anything like if you need a little like expertise on something, just come to me. And that was just kind of my role. And I embraced it. It was a, it was one of those things where, you know, being a coach is way more uh, methodical. I'd say, you know, you have to really dissect every little nitty gritty thing that a guy's doing because if the guy's footwork is wrong or if his alignment's off, then he's not going to fulfill the play. Then he's not going to make a play on the ball. If he's even a yard right up to the left and he's supposed to be a little bit more to the right. So it's kind of just, you look at the game in a different way when you're in that more of that coaching role. So you recently graduated from UPenn. Congratulations. Any future it. plans at all? Uh, any, any social media you want to plug at all either also? Yeah. So, I mean, as of right now, uh, I will be, you know, working for UBS in a uh, financial analyst role for a uh, And I start that in a couple of weeks and uh, also, you know, starting a cannabis company as of right now called Earth and Ivy. Uh, so if anybody who's watching this wants to follow, it's at Earth and Ivy dot, I mean, it's at Earth and Ivy Co. So uh, you can look for some more updates there of uh, the things that are yet to come from our, our new uh, emerging company. Dude, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Anthony Lottie, for coming on and being our season premiere of these interview series. It's going to be going on for the next 10, 15 weeks on the channel. Lottie, thank you. Hey, man. Thank you, man. This is, it's always nice to talk to you, man. So uh, I'm excited to see the, net, the other videos that uh, you have coming up.